Welcome to the Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives and explores the new powers of governments and companies. My name's Gus Hossein. I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. And today, I'm talking to two of my colleagues, Yanis and Ailey. We're going to be talking about Google's attempted takeover of Fitbit and why authorities should tell Google not on our watch. So, let me understand this. Um, Google is trying to buy Fitbit. Yanis, can you tell me why a privacy organization like PI cares about this? So Google announced their plans to buy Fitbit last November, and uh, we immediately figured out that there was something going on there because Google was not the first company to see jumping on health data or the health sector in general. This is kind of a good example that highlights how sensitive personal data might play a role for big tech's digital or data dominance and how they can deprive consumers or users of control over their data or their rights to privacy and data protection. Can we just step back first and, and, um, and ask, why are we specifically focused on Google? Like, are they a sketchy company or something? Ailey, do you have any insight? Yeah, well, exactly. Um, Google is a tech giant and, and that's something that we all know and have been aware of and have been concerned about as the company gets steadily bigger and bigger over the years. And we're not just concerned about Google's enormity, but also their past behavior. Um, They already have so, so much data on us um, through their own services, but also through the acquisition of other companies and services over the years and their history is is not it doesn't look good and they've made promises that they haven't kept before as far as we can see so even thinking about it from the competition perspective there's been numerous investigations and fines and one of the previous uh, things that came to light in in competition was when google bought double click which is obviously really big in advertising. And they made certain promises about privacy and it being a number one priority. Yet years down the line, um, it was reported that Google had deleted the line of their privacy policy that made those commitments. And it's not just from this competition perspective, which obviously has an impact on, on the market and competitors and also ultimately consumers, but also from a data protection perspective, which is something we're also very familiar with. And... Um, For example, one of the first complaints actually on the day that GDPR, the data protection law in the EU came into effect, uh, one of the first complaints was against Google for uh, for infringements of GDPR by the NGO Neub based in Austria. And this resulted ultimately in a fine from the French data protection regulator of 50 million euros, uh, which is currently under appeal. But there you see um, one example of an infringement. And there's been numerous complaints um, in the years since from civil society, whether it's uh, Bayuk, the consumer organization, uh, and its members made complaints about Google's location data uh, practices uh, prompted by the Norwegian Consumer Council reports uh, that revealed Uh, abuse there, but also um, in terms of their online advertising practices. And there's numerous complaints throughout the EU about uh, Google's advertising framework. So that's just some points um, where we can see that Google is really problematic when it comes to competition, when it comes to data protection. And this merger between Google and Fitbit brings those things together so clearly. So explain to me, why does a giant like Google want a relatively small actor like Fitbit? Well, there it goes exactly to that. It goes back to the question of the data and and the valuable data that Fitbit have. So, I mean, I actually don't have a Fitbit myself and not all of us will, but Fitbit is still a popular um a popular company and it's one of the most well-known brands when it comes to fitness trackers and, and wearable health technology. Um, and it is amazing the the amount of data that that Fitbit collects, you know. So there's obviously the things that you put in when you when you get a Fitbit, the things that you might be more aware that you've kind of revealed, you know, whether that's your your birthday, how tall you are, and um, what your sex is. But then there's it, it's so detailed all the all the data that they then go on and get. And one of the things I found <laughs> quite concerning and was the amount of data that their female health uh, data uh, functionality has. So, you know, these are 
there's functionalities to, to try and help with tracking menstruation cycles and also for fertility. But that means you're being asked lots of questions around birth control, around your menstrual cycle, around all sorts of things to do with your mood and symptoms you might have and whether or not you've had unprotected sex or not. So there's like extremely sensitive and intimate data there. And that, um, as Yanis pointed out, is just some of, of the data. There could be you know, there's data about your sleeping patterns, about your heart rates, um, and and all sorts of things. Um, so we and just to been, jump, oh, yeah, sorry, just to jump on what Ailey mentioned about one question that we found extremely interesting when we were like investigating the Fitbit data collection practices as a fitness tracker or a fitness app is the again in the female health uh, special app it has or the, the the female health part, let's say. Um, the question of whether users are having unprotected sex. And it's a question that has come up before and we're surprised to see it because we encountered this question last summer when Eva was doing the research into menstruation apps, uh, not the Fitbit app, but menstruation apps around the globe in general. And we saw that menstruation apps that are active globally are also asking this question and ultimately sending this data to Facebook, another member of the GAFAM now. So this like pointed to the question of why wh- why is this so important to them and and second why is Facebook and in this case potentially Google behind uh, receiving this data and the answers to the question of whether you're having unprotected sex and ultimately I think that this can be just another attribute for targeted advertising if you want to narrow down your audience and offer advertisements to them then you just have to then you could just add another parameter, I would say. And in this case, it would be, oh, willing to take more risks, willing to try something else, or we like, it, it's a, if you think of it in a sense of statistics, it just adds one more category at the expense, I don't know, of our dignity by by gathering s- such data that's, that's so intrusive. So just to, to, to summarize, Fitbit has a huge amount of really intimate, sensitive data about our um, about our movements and and about our health, and we already know that Google has another huge bucket of our data, and we really are concerned that they combine them. And um, the, the examples I was pointing out before show that where promises have been made in the past about keeping data separate, they've not necessarily been kept. So here you you could end up with you know an even more detailed profile than you already had. And so now we're we're running this campaign. We're we're announcing all this work that we've done, um, and I'm we're asking authorities to step in. What what can they actually do? Uh, why haven't they been doing it already? And um, what's next? Okay, so the proposed acquisition is currently under review already in the United States and in Australia. Actually, the it's very interesting because uh, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission released their kind of initial assessment or the outcome of their informal review. They started this informal review into the proposed acquisition already in February. And uh, we also submitted evidence in March asking the commission to block the merger or impose very strict um, and enforceable safeguards. And uh, their initial findings or the outcome of their informal review came up. And we were very happy to see that to a great extent, they share our concerns and they do mention the relevance of data or the vast and sensitive data Google will be getting their hands on if the merger is cleared. On Monday, the 15th, the merger was officially notified to the European Commission. This means that uh, as a customary rule, Google always notifies its merger because it's a tech giant to the EU regulators. In the EU, because of the digital single market, in order for a merger to go through, it needs to be notified to the European Commission, which is kind of the executive authority of the EU and the regulator that needs to clear the merger or block it. Uh, There were already pre-notification proceedings going on, which is kind of pre-notification talks between Google, Fitbit, and the European Commission officials. And then we had the formal notification this Monday. This means that the time the formal that by the time the formal investigation takes place, we begin with a formal investigation, which has which can have one or two phases. Right now we're in phase one, which lasts for 25 business days. And the European Commission is expected to, had, to hand down its decision, its assessment of the merger 
by 20 July 2020. Uh, this decision can also be that the merger raises serious concerns from a competition perspective and we need to open up a phase two investigation. The phase two investigation lasts for quite longer, more than two months, and uh, its main aim is to allow for more uh, allow for more time for the commission to consider relevant evidence. Um, we thought it was a very good opportunity time-wise since this also, as I said in the beginning, constitutes a great opportunity for the commission to uphold consumers' well-being and uh, sanction data exploitative practices by big tech to start the petition to kind of put some extra pressure and also to show the commission that we are on board and uh, that this is something of wider or global concern. This is something that the European Commission should lead by example. And this is something that uh, consumers across the EU also feel passionate about because so far we had quite some support from consumers and there are already people signing on the petition, although we just released it today. So you just need to go to pvcy.org slash not watch. And um, at the same time, of course, from, from a quite like a purely legal perspective, we will be also seeking to intervene before the procedure. And... Um, and actually be be a third party where we can put forward these arguments and hopefully um, assist the commission in its assessment. Just to, to geek out for a sec at a, at a legal level, it is pretty cool that competition regulators who are quite powerful in the sense that they can actually stop mergers of multinational giants that they're starting to pay attention to these data questions that, you know, even just a few years ago would have been considered too geeky. What What's changed that all of a sudden we now have two regulatory uh, authorities in the competition field actually acting? Uh, I agree with you. I, th I think it's quite fascinating that now you see competition regulators referencing more and more data protection frameworks or even like the data angle in their assessments and decisions. I, I think what changed is that as as data protection regulation was moving forward or as big tech giants like Google, Facebook, and so on um, st st started relying more and more on this data. And at the same time, I think as we had more and more revelations like Cambridge Analytica and, and the public was more and more aware of the dangers that are associated with potential data abuse and exploitation, I think regulators just felt the need to catch up. And I think the start was probably made, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one or two years ago with the German Competition Authority and its decision against Facebook, which is one of the most important decisions in this field, because they they write, they write they underline that they cooperated with, a, uh, with their data protection counterparts, the data protection regulators in Germany, to issue this decision. And uh, what they actually did is that they sanctioned Facebook and they relied on the fact that um, the data Facebook processes uh, is a vast amount of data that contributes to its dominance. And uh, the way this data is processed without users being 100% in control or not being processed in a completely transparent way uh, can also distort competition or also at least constitutes a violation of relevant competition laws. Yeah, no, I was oh, sorry. I was just going to jump in there. Um to say, I mean, I think in a way the question is also like, why weren't they doing this before? And if they had been doing this, what would the world look like? You know, would we have these giant companies? And I think it's often very convenient for, for the tech giants in particular to argue that the law is, is behind technology as though it's some kind of free-floating thing. But actually, that, that's just a convenient excuse. And we do have these powerful legal frameworks. And often, really, what's missing is enforcement of these frameworks. So that's why it's so important when there is an opportunity for the action that the regulators, in this case, um, we're talking about the European Competition Regulator, but we're also really interested, as Yana said, to see what others around the world do, uh, take that opportunity and, and take that action. Because, you know, our, our lives have changed and fundamentally now everything we do has something related to the digital. And so even if you don't have a Fitbit, I mean, you can't escape Google, whether it's in your home, in the classroom, and, and now really in, in health, you no? Know? And so there, it's not just about that exact data from the current Fitbit users, but what 
this merger would enable in the future the expansion of Google into these other markets, not just wearables, but related to health data and, and you know, insurance and, and all the things that that could facilitate in the future. And, and it's definitely not the future that we want to see. And at the same time, to, to just highlight what you mentioned about existing legal frameworks being adequate to accommodate uh, this review or the sanctioning of data exploitative practices, uh, I I think that most of the decisions that we have so far, if not all, but actually no, all of the decisions that so far have come out from competition authorities did not rely on any kind of amended competition framework or any kind of new competition framework. I think the principles are just there and many people, you see this coming from the big tech lobby actually, as Ailey mentioned, uh, that they always lobby for more regulation or that we need a kind of new law to regulate this behavior or things or things were not the same in the past, or this kind of um, th- this kind of practices uh, have not been regulated or are out in the wild. But no, I-, I think most of the decisions that have come out rely on existing legal frameworks that have been there for years. Principles have, such as transparency and accountability have been there for years. And I, I don't think if having a new framework is going to make things better, what we actually should be counting uh, more on is uh, active enforcement. Ailey, you were starting to talk about the kind of world we we want or don't want as a result. And, I, and so I'm curious if I could just get philosophical for a second and put you both on uh, on your toes on this one. Um, is, it, is this a case with our campaign? Is this a case of a privacy organization using uh, whatever legal mechanism it can, in this case, competition law, to go after uh, these these adversaries uh, that we have that are just these massive data giants, or do we actually have an interest in competition itself? Do, do we actually think that we'll have a, a safer future, a, a fairer future, if there aren't these giants, and we actually do have a, a an interest in fair, free, and competitive markets? I think it's both. I think it's the fair... It's it's definitely the first one because we are using a competition law framework because a competition law framework is relevant to the rights we are defending and uh, a, a competition law framework is relevant to consumers' well-being because it's there to protect that and uh, sanction unlawful competition practices. And uh, yes, a data privacy angle can also distort competition if if a company's dominance is heavily relying on the exploitation of users' data. But at the same time, it's also the future we want to see in a sense of what is there uh, in the market. And I think if we're talking about innovation or if we're talking about more and more products, as we rely more and more on technology as everyday users, and as Ailey exactly mentioned, Google is all around us. In this case, uh, Google Classroom, Google is on our phones, everything is interconnected. And that's why we also consider this to be a great opportunity for the European Commission is that data exploitative practices like this one should be sanctioned to let competition grow, let innovation grow. But at the very same time, innovation that can rely on more privacy friendly uh, or data friendly solutions. And if you're a competitor of Google, you really won't feel the need to compete anymore and you'll be thrown out of the market. If you see Google buying Fitbit, for example, you know you're pretty much screwed in terms of advertising because, oh, one more data set for Google in their hands, like they don't have already too many. So if you have a business, let's say, or a search engine that happens to be a very privacy-friendly search engine and you don't track your users, or an mobile phone operating system or a social network, you won't really feel the need to compete. This will take innovation away. I think the European Commission is pretty much aware of this, and this is definitely one of the goals they're trying to enforce, not seeing uh, companies being active in other fi- being active in other jurisdictions or taking uh, innovation out of the EU context. So maybe they, they will be sensitive to that. But yes, from an innovation or competition perspective, I think it's also worth for a privacy NGO advocating for... Uh, for solutions that do not rely on the exploitation of people. Yeah, so I would agree. I think um, it's a good question, Gus, but you can't really separate those two different scenarios out. They're they're intertwined. And we always talk about privacy as an enabling right. So privacy is a, the right to privacy then enables you to exercise other rights, you, whether that's the freedom of expression, whether that's... Um, 
the right to protest, whether that's your social and economic rights, all these rights often at the core and, and the base is, is that need for the right to, to privacy. And even the other day, uh, our colleagues were highlighting that even informs and enables your right to rest, which is also very important. And, you know, actually, can you really rest safely when uh, your, your Fitbit and, and then Google is, is tracking all of that data. But I think to, to more to the point, privacy as a reality is impossible without some competition. It doesn't make sense to have lots of small companies with really horrible invasive practices. And we see that to an extent in the whole ad tech ecosystem. Um, but eventually, with the tech giants, you also don't want companies that get so big that they can't respect the right to privacy. And I think that's where we found ourselves. They have so much data on every angle of our life. They have so many so many products, so many services in so many different contexts that we really can't escape them. So I think both of these things are, are interdependent and one supports the other. Yeah, it's interesting to, to think that Fitbit maybe isn't isn't a very powerful company maybe it doesn't have long to live on its own and that maybe there isn't really a sustainable market for these types of trackers but it's only through the intervention of the giants to buy these companies make them uh, financially viable just so they can exploit it that is the way that this will only take place in the future this is absolutely fascinating and we, we can't forget that google has been active in the health sector in other ways, such as working with hospitals in the United States to grab data as well. So this is a large market that, well, the health uh, sector that Google's very keen to get into. Can you just maybe think a little bit deeper beyond just serving us better ads, what Google hopes to get out of this type of activity in this sector? Well, I think what's, what should be useful to note here is that it's not just Google engaging in, let's say, the health markets or health insurance markets. We see, like in the past years, we start seeing big tech wanting to get their hands on health data. And uh, we already saw that uh, last summer, for example, with Amazon, when our investigation found out that following the deal that Amazon had struck between the National Health Service in the UK and the company, to, to allow voice, act, voice activated devices uh, help users look up their symptoms on the NHS database, their conditions, their diseases, and so on, or illnesses. This was based on pretty much a contract between the Department of Health and Amazon, which Amazon offered to execute at no cost. Potentially, Amazon is getting lots of health related queries because people would normally not ask their voice-activated device about their symptoms, but now since the NHS is prompting them to do so, they can easily do it, and then Amazon gets to collect more data like that. Uh, I think it's very... This sounds, in a sense, of quite as a conspiracy theory, but then you think that it's not really a conspiracy theory when you find out that a few months after Amazon started filing patterns for pharmacies in, the, in Australia, the UK, and some other countries too, according to reports by the NBC. And I think this is quite an important point that proves that there is, like, it seems that health data is the new black, let's put it like that, because more and more tech giants are trying to jump onto that. Now, what this can mean long term down the line or moving away from targeted or online advertising, I think partnerships with um, governments and the public sector might uh, be relevant here. We see, we see Palantir doing kind of the same thing in response to coronavirus and their partnership again with the UK Department of Health and the UK government. Uh, we also see uh, the Amazon example, as I mentioned, Google developing similar par partnerships with health insurance companies. And uh, I, I think that maybe this is just a new area to be active in as a company to pitch data solutions to certain governments when it comes to health. As we see more and more health systems being not efficient 100% or as we see more and more health services not being able to accommodate people's needs, maybe big tech has, has figured it all out and their new plan is to cooperate with governments to be the ones facilitating uh, these services on their behalf, such as data processing, GP appointments, record keeping, activities like that. I, I don't know if uh, Ailey had another thought or wants to add to that. 
No, I think I think that you know probably at times like this, health data is on on everyone's mind, and and really it is it's so sensitive and it it's so personal and so valuable at the same time. So I think any you know anything to do to do with that deserves the utmost scrutiny and especially in in circumstances you know where we are talking about these giants already have so much data and again it goes back to to what we we are concerned about is is the ability to also you know infer more data from other data so you can then find out more about someone not just you know not just what's in that data but even more about them so it becomes exponentially more invasive over time so if somebody's listening to this podcast and getting increasingly um, angry about what they're hearing, what can be done to stop this from happening? Well, first, have a look at our website and sign this petition because really the European Commission is uh, is a, a giant regulator in this sphere and it does have some power to do something about this. And we really, really want to get the message across to them. Uh, we will be formally intervening, but we also have this petition where we will be delivering it to the commission, where we will highlight the concern by civil society organizations and, and consumers. And these concerns are echoed as well around the world. So this is a first step and something very practical that people can do. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. And thank you both for joining today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you want to get involved with this specific topic, um, as Ailey said, you can come to our website. We now have a URL shortener, so it's easier to say during a podcast. So you just need to go to pvcy.org slash not watch. You can like and subscribe to this podcast as well. And you can also get access to it on our website. Come to the website, sign up to our mailings, and uh, you can also follow us on social media of your choice. The music is courtesy of Sepia.